A lot of time and energy is wasted coming up with solutions that in the end no one really wants. Well, in this episode you're going to learn about a radical approach to design that greatly increases the chance that the eventual outcomes will be fully embraced by the end users. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Victor and this is the Service Design Show, episode 154. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make all the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Victor Udueva. Victor is the founder of Justice by Design and the Chief Experience Officer and Service Design Lead at NASA. I'm pretty sure that you've been practicing participatory design or at least know about it. The approach to design where you involve members from the community into the design process. And depending on your challenge, these members can be customers, employees, but also patients, students, and parents. The rationale of involving the community in the design process is that it will increase the chance that you'll end up with a relevant solution. As great as the idea of participatory design is, the reality shows that in practice, participation only happens in very selective parts of the process. According to Victor, we can and should take this a step further. We shouldn't be designing solutions for the community. No, not even with them. Solutions should be designed by the community. Victor calls this approach radical participatory design. And in this episode, you'll learn all the ins and outs. So if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll know what are the benefits and challenges when involving the community from start to end, from top to bottom, and get an answer to the question, is there still a role for the design professional if the entire process is driven by the community? If you find conversations like this interesting and want to keep growing as a service design professional, I encourage you to click that subscribe button and that bell icon because we bring a new conversation like this every week or so. So that's about it for the introduction. And now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Victor Urueva. Welcome to the show, Victor. Hey, it's good to be here. Good to see you, Mark. Good to see you as well. Uh, Really looking forward to this episode and the topic that we're going to address again, uh, a topic that um, I I don't know a lot about and I want to learn. And definitely uh, you're one of the people who uh, who knows a lot more about this. So uh, looking forward to this. But Victor, before we uh, start and uh, try to unravel what we're going to talk about today, could you give a brief introduction about who you are and what you do? Yes, I am the CXO, Customer Experience Officer, CTO, Customer, or Chief, you could say Chief Technical Officer, and Service Design Lead for a part of NASA. Um, it's two programs at NASA called uh, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR, and the Small Business Technology Transfer Research Program, STTR. Hmm. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, if people want to know more details, they'll uh, just look up your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> but we're going <laughs> to go into some personal details as we always have a, a lightning question round. I've got five questions for you and your task is to answer them as quickly and briefly as possible. The first thing that comes to your mind. You ready? Okay, I'm ready. Let's do this. What did you want to become when you were a kid? Astronaut. Hmm, you're, you're on the way. Uh, <laughs> what's um, what's the what's the maybe number one thing on your bucket list? Number one thing on my bucket list is to live in Asia. Live meaning more than more than a year. Hmm. Cool. Um, which book or books are you reading at this moment, if any? <laughs> I'm reading too many books at this moment. Um, one book I'm reading is Designs for the Pluriverse. Uh, another book I'm reading is Soul of a Woman. 
Another book I'm reading is um, Stand Your Ground by Kelly Brown Douglas. Uh, and I go, I, I read, I tend to read a lot of books at the same time because when they're nonfiction, I only do it a chapter at a time so I can absorb the information. Mm. We'll add the reading list uh, to the show notes. <laughs> uh, okay. Next, uh, next question is related to your bucket list, but I didn't know that up front. Uh, if you could uh, work from anywhere in the world right now, where would you like to work from? I think if I could work anywhere in the world, I'd probably be working from Nigeria. That's where I have most of my family. So it'd be nice to just be around them. Uh, and being in that environment um, so I can spend time with them mm. outside of work or during meals. Mm. Uh, maybe it's possible with all that remote working going on these days. Uh, Victor, yeah. fifth, fifth and final question is, do you recall the moment you sort of got in touch with service design? The moment? Hmm. No, I was feel like a it, moment? No. Yep. Yeah, I feel like it was gradual, especially because of the the spectrum between the different types of design. So. Um, I think I would say probably the, f the, the, the first big, big step in the gradual process was when I was working for Google, uh, multinational tech company, and I was working on an educational service that had components of business design and org design and service design and product design all rolled up into one. And it was interna interna an international educational service that we were offering. Cool. Thank you for letting us know a bit more about uh, who you are and where you, what you read, <laughs> where, where you want to live and work. Uh, that helps to set some context. Now, Victor, let's transition into uh, the topic um, you suggested and proposed like um, that might be interesting to share with the service design community. And uh, the title that I took away from this, and uh, I think this is also a title that you uh, sort of use, Radical Participation participatory design. This isn't going to be the only one I'm going to stumble upon that word, but that's correct, <laughs> right? Yes, that's correct. So um, if we fast forward to the end of this episode, like what is it that you hope people will take away from our conversation that's going to ha unfold in the next, I don't know, 45 minutes? I'm really hoping that more and more designers, especially specifically designers who are working within an organization, they're part of an organization, they're not just a freelance designer, are able to employ more of the participatory practices and specifically a radical participatory approach as opposed to what I might call a colonial participatory approach. Mm -hmm. now, and it's hard, it's hard yeah. to do from within the context of an organization. I think that's the challenge. It, you know, it's, it's easier. I've seen some people do it as, oh, I'm a, I'm a professor in a university and I did some project in a community. Great, easy. But can you do it if you work for a nonprofit or work for a for-profit or work for the government, et cetera? It's a lot harder and there are other challenges there. We'll talk about uh, hopefully those challenges uh, today. Now, I feel that there's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, challenge uh, here because I want to ask you about why you care so deeply about radical participatory design, but maybe first we need to understand a bit more about what RD, R, RPD is without going into all the details. Like, could you, could you maybe mix up those two? Yeah. Is it helpful first to just talk about what participatory design is before let's we talk that. about radical? <laughs> yeah, let's do yeah. That. So, yeah. And I think a lot of people have heard this term before it goes by many different uh, phrases, collaborative design, co-design, co-participatory design, et cetera, et cetera. And it just means that instead of the professional designers doing all of the work, um, at some point in the process, they are designing with, alongside the potential users of the system or the service or the product. Uh, in some places, some people use the term to refer to designing with not just the users, but all stakeholders. So maybe if you work in an organization that includes your executives or other people that might be involved. Um, other people use it specifically to talk about involving the users in the process of design. So that's participatory design. Mm -hmm. And now the radical aspect. 
Yeah, so I, I, I didn't always use the adjective radical. I, I, I started doing it last year only because I realized over many years when I would meet people who were doing participatory design, they always meant something different than I meant. And so I would be very excited and then we start to talk at a conference or I'm reading their paper and then I realize, oh, we're using the same term, but it, it means different things. So I use radical to, to, to differentiate between what I'm doing and maybe what someone else might be doing. It doesn't mean that other people aren't doing what I'm doing, but it's just a differentiator. And I say radical not in the colloquial sense, which a lot of people use to mean extreme. I'm using radical meaning completely, right? So it's coming from the Latin word radix, which means the root. So it's to the root. It's all the way down from beginning to end, from top to bottom. And so normally what happens when you see participatory design, it, people mean a, a number of different things. One, they might mean, okay, I'm just including the perspective of the users. Two, they might mean a method. Are you going to do a user interview? Are you going to do participatory design, usability study? Three, they might mean a way of doing a method. So I can do a design studio with a group of designers, or I could do a design studio and invite users to be a part of the design studio, right? So it's a way of doing that same method. And four, they mean a methodology, which is a collection of methods or guiding philosophies that help you to choose a particular method at a particular point in a process. When I say radical participatory design, I don't mean any of those. I, I use the term meta methodology, meaning it's not a, I don't have a toolkit of methods. I, I don't, it doesn't say use this method at this point. If you look at some participatory design toolkits, it'll say, okay, do this work, do steps A, B, C, and D. And when you frame the problem, then reach out to the community, invite them in, and then do these types of activities with them. When I say radical participatory design, there is, there's none of that. It's just really a, an approach. You can use whatever methodology you want to do, but it means really three things. Number one, the community is always present and always leading. So instead of having times where you're doing work with the community and times where you're planning apart from the community, the community is a part of the research and design team. They are members of the team from top to bottom all the way through. There are no meetings, no phone calls, no discussions apart from them because they are on the team. Um, number two, the community members or the users, you could say, outnumber the professional designers. And that's more of a guideline. It helps improve the dynamics, uh, not necessary. Uh, and then number three, the community members own the outcomes and artifacts of the process, as well as the narratives around those outcomes and artifacts. And so that's kind of what I mean. Uh, you know, normally what would happen is you, you have a workshop on Monday, you have another workshop on Wednesday, and then on Tuesday, as professional designers, we're looking at the outcomes of workshop one and looking to see if it's still in line with our goals for these series of workshops. We're trying to see if any new information came from workshop number one that introduces nonlinearity that sends workshop two in a different direction. We're trying to see what information from workshop one we carry over to workshop two. And all of this is sense making and decision making and interpretation and evaluation. It's all happening without the community members present. So when I say radical, they're always there. They're full members of the team from top to bottom, from beginning to end. They're always leading and they own the outcomes and narratives of the work. Mm. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I have an even better understanding uh, what this is and what you mean. And uh, a lot of things and uh, terms came to my mind here. Um, but let's maybe we can go back in time for a second. And uh, I'm really curious, how did you arrive at this philosophy, approach, mindset? What was your journey? Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize it. Uh, designers didn't work like this. It's, it's kind of funny for me to say that. You know, I, I started in engineering design. So the way that the way that I was taught in school and university was to design based on feasibility. You know, you get the requirements, you get the information you need, and and you you satisfy those requirements. So I wasn't taught the the human factors or the human elements side of it. But I did a project in El Salvador where I was building dual composting latrines with a group of uh, friends and other students. And I remember traveling back to El Salvador in Central America one year later. And the community members 
whom we worked alongside to build those dual compost and latrines in the village, like small villages of like 250 people. They didn't always use the latrines in the way that we thought they would use them. So for instance, one family used it as a closet to store, you know, farming equipment. Another family used it as a bathroom for very, very important guests, but never for themselves. And so that's when I first learned, oh, wow, I need to actually consider do people want it? Can they repair it if it's broken? Can, do they want to maintain it? Do they show ownership over it? All of that stuff. And that, that's when I started this journey. So I, I had a toolkit at one point. Um, in 2007, the Gates Foundation gave some money to IDO.org to build this toolkit. And I was doing work in international development. And the Gates Foundation, of course, does international development. They focus in global health and global education. So this toolkit that IDO.org created was used in the international development space. And we were very excited because then it could help us take some of the methods used in industrial design and software design and bring it into the international development space. So we're very excited. We thought it was going to be the magic answer. Um, and it turned out not to be for a number of reasons. But one of, one of the interesting things is that I remember that there was some place in that toolkit where it mentioned bringing in community members and doing this work alongside them. And I guess just the way that I interpreted that, I thought it meant, you know, <laughs> you, 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 bring, you get the community, community members together at the very beginning, the first thing you do, and you just do the work alongside them. So it's how, I've, it's how I did the work. And then I realized, oh, a lot of people just bring them in at certain points or a lot of people bring them in, but they're still in control of the process. They're still leading the process. It's not the leadership isn't coming from the community. And so it's one of those examples where you have a leader in the design community creating materials for other people to use. And they might get mad at me for saying this, presenting a particular way of doing it, even though they themselves may not be doing it that way. And I know this because I we I have since that time worked at a company where we've hired IDEO and you get to see kind of what it looks like. So, yeah, it was just my particular interpretation. Maybe it has to do with my background and, and how I understood things. And I was surprised to find out that that isn't how they normally do it and that people have a range of ways of practicing participatory design. Fascinating. Um, I'm uh, for, for the sake of contrast, and uh, like in, in many of these conversations, we need to generalize. But um, I'm I'm really curious. Do you feel that there are advantages? I'm I'm sure you feel that there are advantages to approaching it like uh, in this full on participatory way, this this radical way, this fully making the community a full um, full member of the design team. Like, what are some benefits that you see? What happens? Yeah, there's different reasons that people do participatory design in general, right? So number one, people might do it because it actually improves the design outcomes. So I want this design to be better, to work better. So I need the knowledge of these people. So I'm going to bring them in in order to improve the outcome. Right. Some people do it for mutual learning. And I'm glad that we say mutual because it's not just unidirectional, it's bidirectional. So I or we as professional designers, we learn the lived experiential knowledge that the community has, their, their cultural knowledge, as well as the community of users learning the design knowledge or the institutional mainstream, whatever type of educational knowledge that we have, they learn that. So it's a mixing of the two. So some people do it for mutual learning. Some people do it, number three, from a perspective of what I would call justice or de democratic processes. How can we come in and decide what people have access to or can use? They should be able to decide that, right? There's a, there's a phrase that some communities say, nothing for us without us, nothing for us without us. And so if there is something for us, we should have say in how it's created and, and, and what happens to it, what it looks like, et cetera. And then I would say there are some people who do it specifically for what I would call change after the design. So if I, if I truly want this 
design or uh, effort to work, it requires that the community or the people who use it truly own it. And ownership is greater if they have been a part of the process to create it. So some people do it from that. So there's a whole, there's a whole, whole host of reasons. Um, I do it specifically from a justice perspective. So if, if you said, for instance, that actually, Victor, the design outcome would be exactly the same. It wouldn't actually necessarily be better. It still, from my perspective, would be important to do because of uh, what is right and what is true and what is good from a justice perspective. Like you, you're creating things for people. Um, they should have a say in, in how that works. But from a business perspective, you know, again, it does actually improve the outcomes. It, it, I guess the, the best way to think of it is, is from an epistemological perspective. So when you talk about the ways of knowing and how we know things, right? That's when I, when I say epistemology, the study of knowing and how we know things. What happens in the Western societies, uh, especially post-Enlightenment, we, we have definitely like lionized and valorized a specific way of knowing. This is what I call mainstream institutional knowledge. You could call it third person knowing. I'm an outside observer. I can run scientific experiments and I can observe things and I can reach and arrive at the truth, right? But there are other types and ways of knowings, right? There is first person knowing. So my lived experiential knowledge from, from life. There is second person knowing, which is this type of interrelational subjectivity or what communities learn. So cultural knowledge or spiritual knowledge uh, through groups of people. But even regardless of if it's first or second person, there are different categories, such as um, there is embodied knowing, there's intuitive knowing, there's aesthetic knowing, and I can go on and on and on. And so what, what we're learning is that it's not just inclusion of the voice of the community members, because when I just say it's their voice, I'm actually, I'm actually not giving it the true value that it is. It's actually expertise. If, if my knowledge, my educational knowledge from working in university is considered an expertise, then you should also consider the other kinds of knowledge and expertise. And so what I've learned over the years is that in the work that I do, I actually think even more important than the design expertise, not everyone would agree with me, but more important than the design expertise is actually the cultural knowledge and the, the lived experiential knowledge of the people. So it, it actually makes sense um, because it just doesn't work very well when I don't have that knowledge guiding the process that we're doing. This brings me to the question uh, around um, maybe uh, it's not the, maybe the lack of uh, adoption yet. Like, um, does the appreciation for these different types of knowledge uh, and then a specific appreciation for the uh, third person type of knowledge, which seems to be very strongly embedded in uh, the Western culture. Like, is that maybe one of the obstacles to finding a broader adaptation of this radical approach to participatory design? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, it, it, it speaks to the, the, the creation of the world, right? There was this debate in anthropology. Um, at one point, anthropologists, some anthropologists started using the word ontology. Right. And there's a there are different ways of defining ontology. But in this specific way, we're talking about a way of of um, being uh, different types of reality or existence. So um, and there was this debate in anthropology because they would say, well, wait a minute, there there shouldn't be anything called ontological anthropology. Right. You're all you're doing is just talking about different worldviews. This culture here, this person, they just have different worldviews. But what these new anthropologists at the time were saying is that, no, it's it's not just worldviews. People actually inhabit and live in different worlds. So it's an actually different reality and understanding and existence. Right. And so, yes, what we're talking about is, I, I think, really, since since the Enlightenment, since the domination of the West over the world, co colonization, it hasn't just been colonization of land. It's been a colonization of histories, um, a colonization of knowledge or types of knowledge, really a colonization of ontologies. And so we've lost a lot of what I would call relational ontologies, relational ways of being and existing in the world. Um, and we kind of have more of this type of individualist, objectivist, I could say more positivist, et cetera, ways of being in this world in which we are, we are separate from the world and we can observe the world and we can arrive at the truth of everything. 
there has been growing interest though because of the increasing desire to reconnect to indigenous ways of knowing around the world, um, specifically in Asia, Africa, um, and the Americas as well, right? And especially because of this, I would say, movement to what we call decolonize everything. At least in the US, we have it. Decolonize this, decolonize that, decolonize that. So there's this, this deco decolonial turn that's happening. And part of that means delinking or disconnecting from this system where there's only one way or the, the best way of knowing and understanding that there are other ways of knowing. So it's growing, but yes, it's very difficult because there is a there is a, a culture and it's not just in the West, I wanna say, what you said is true, it's in the West, but it be, because of the domina domination of the West over the entire world and ways of being and putting a McDonald's in every country and things like that, it, 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 it has really gone everywhere. And so we, we are trying to learn and reconnect to some of um, older ways of being, um, and indigenous ways of being and knowing. So when you shared this story with um, the common man, <laughs> let's go. What are some um, of the objections you hear or the, the, the uh, skepticism? Like, what do you get back as a response? Yeah, it, well, there's different different responses depending on if you're talking about, say, an executive in an organization that can allow this process to happen or not. Or if you're talking about professional designers who don't necessarily agree with doing it that way, right? Or if you're talking about the communities who might be invited to be a part of this type of process. So there's different responses from different groups. Um, are, are you talking about a specific group or do you want to walk through all of them? I would say, uh, let, let's start with the design community. Yeah, so, you know, I think one, th there've been a lot of problems, I think, we don't have to go into it with uh, the design thinking movement, right? Hasn't all been good. There's been a lot of a lot of issues with it. But one thing I will say that I do like is the understanding and the democratization of design, right? I think one of the things they're trying to say is that, hey, everyone should be doing design. I try to go further than that and say, actually, everyone is doing design, whether they know it or not, right? Um, and you, they can learn different ways of doing design. So one thing that professional designers will say is, well, well, well wait a minute, wait a minute, where, where is my role? If, if, if this is just about communities doing design and we're equal, what, what's the point of me? I'm a professional, I've studied all these years. I should have some say, I should be leading the process. So, I mean, the way that I respond to that is just to say that I actually, and again, I'm not everyone, I'm only speaking for myself. I actually think the, the community knowledge, the cultural knowledge, the spiritual knowledge, the lived experiential knowledge is greater than the institutional knowledge. And I'll give you an example to explain what I mean. Imagine that you're sick, right? Or you're feeling something in your body and you go to the doctor, the medical doctor. It's very difficult for a medical doctor to help you, to treat you, to get you to feel better without any of your lived experiential knowledge. If they're just using their institutional, I mean, of course they can try to put things and, and measure where's the temperature and, but they need you to say something about how it hurts and where it hurts and when it hurts and things like that. In fact, there was an entire television show in the United States called House in which this medical doctor, he was supposed to be a diagnostic magician. He could figure out the toughest problems that no other hospitals or doctors could figure. Could, could determine. But one of the things he would do is he, he would have his team of doctors who were doing medical fellowships. So they had finished medical school and they had finished residency and they would break into the homes of the patients that they were trying to diagnose because the patients in this television show often were not telling the doctors everything that the doctors needed. They were hiding some certain things because of embarrassment or ignorance, or maybe there was a legal implication if they said what happened. So they hid information, but the doctors needed that information in order to come up with a diagnosis. So they would break into the home, do some investig investigation, get that information, and then use that. However, there are many cases, you know, maybe not really huge problems, but there are many cases where you can listen to your body and without having any type of medical educational knowledge, 
you can figure out, oh, I'm hungry, I need more water, I'm dehydrated, I need to rest, I need to sleep more. Even think about a woman who's giving birth. Feeling the pain and which positions ease the pain more or which positions have less pain um, allows the woman to move into positions that actually help to facilitate and expedite the delivery of the baby. So, so there, are, there are actual natural inbuilt ways in which we can listen to our body in order to achieve some of those results. So that's an example. I can give others, but that's an example of how I think lived experiential knowledge can be actually greater than the, the, the uh, institutional mainstream knowledge without any context. And yeah, yeah. And then, and then uh, going back to that question uh, from sort of the trained or professional designer and then asking you like, what's my role in this process i i totally get that question i i see the design professional for a very large part as a translator between like people with a challenge and and a solution and like is 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 that role different in your perspective yeah and i didn't talk about this earlier because i was trying to give you a short answer but yeah the model is different so I'd say the dominant model in my design, professional design world is the designer as facilitator when you do participatory design, right? So you are facilitating, you, you will run the sessions, you kind of lead people through the process, et cetera. Now, as much as we try, as much as we try, we, I think, are unable to fully neutralize the inherent power in facilitation. We, we, we say, okay, you know, Try to be unbiased we try to do this and that but really there's power in facilitation because facilitators make decisions right they choose processes um they're always they're always exerting power not necessarily in bad ways but they just are by nature of the position so in radical participatory design we don't use a model of designer as facilitator we actually use a model of designer as community member community member as designer and community member as facilitator. So let me walk through those three mm -hmm. uh, briefly. When I say designer as community member, I don't necessarily mean that the designer has now been living with this community for 20 years, so they're now an actual community member. What I mean is that as a community member, the designer sits alongside all of the other community members, equal to all of those community members, and brings the designer's skill sets of research and design, laying them alongside equal to all of the other assets and skill sets that all of the other community members bring, right? So there can be community members that are good videographers. There can be community members that are historian. Like everyone is bringing assets. So it's not only that we value the designer's skill set, we value everyone's skill set. And in fact, one of the methods that you find in participatory design methodologies or toolkits is what we call um, participatory appraisal or community appraisal, where we go through to see what skill sets does everyone have to bring to the table and what can we use in order to do the work we're doing. So that's one. Designer now is equal to all the other members and the skill sets they bring sit alongside all the skill sets and assets everyone brings. The second one is easy. Community member does design work. So the community member as designer, they're participating in the design. The community member as researcher, they're participating in the research. The third one is community member as facilitator. So if you were to come into my project right now at NASA, or if you were to come and observe some of my community projects, it would be difficult for you to tell who is the professional designer and who isn't because you would not see me facilitating all the sessions. Facilitation is done by the community members. Now it's true, there are cases where I've done work where the community members, there may be no member of the community that's on the design and research team that feels comfortable facilitating. And in that case, what we do is we do a slow, gradual process where in the beginning they're watching and eventually we're doing it together and eventually they're doing more of it and I'm watching, observing and helping. But um, yeah, they, they actually will facilitate the process. And oftentimes there are community members who do facilitation as part of their work or their lives. So it, uh, we, we use those skills. So it's not that the designer is facilitating because they have the best skills and that's most valued. Anyone can facilitate. And what this does, I'll give you one more thing. It actually changes the methodology you may end up using. So instead of necessarily doing human-centered design, 
in the context of service design or as the guiding methodology of service design. Um, I've done projects where we have ended up doing things like uh, society centered design, community centered design, life centered design, planet centered design. I've done projects where we do a lot more asset based methodologies. So human centered design is a deficit based methodology. You say, what's the problem? And you try to fix the problem. Again, that comes from a Western mindset. There are a lot of ones that are not problem based at all, right? So we end up doing things more like futures design, which is based on our vision, not on the problem. Um, positive deviance, which is based on actual uh, successes within the community that we then uncover and then broadcast and share with others. Um, systems uh, practices, which are about improving the health of a system, not focusing specifically on the problem. I can go on and on, but all of those come out more naturally specifically because the communities do not like to define themselves by what they lack. They love to define themselves by what they bring to the table and what they have. Man, so good. Uh, I need to replay this episode uh, uh, after we're done. <laughs> uh, well, again, so many questions, but one that is sort of nagging me all the time is I feel that there's, and maybe this is my, my limiting belief and bias, that someone is driving the process. Somebody has an agenda. Um, Maybe your reply will be there's a shared agenda, but I'm curious, like how does how does this process work, and maybe what kind of challenges lend themselves for for this approach? Like somebody needs to own either the 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 desire to create a better future or the desire to solve a problem. Yeah, um, I mean definitely. And yes, you're right about my answer. <laughs> it's a type of relational ownership, a collective ownership. Um, so I think what tends to happen with participatory design is as a, as a professional designer, I'm imposing my project on the community. When you do radical participatory design, the community actually has a say, right? The, the, because they're there from the beginning, from beginning to end, from top to bottom, they're actually there during the framing, uh, deciding what to do and how, go ahead. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, this is a, it feels like this is the key moment. How, yes. do we, how do we get to, like, what's the big bang? Because when you mention they, they are part of the framing, like, there has to, it, it, it's a groundswell or something like, somebody needs to bring these people together or something needs to happen. You, you're curious about how it starts? Somehow. Like, how, how do we? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so. So yes, um, the way I tend to look about it, look at it is through three lenses: who who initiates, who leads, who participates. Right. So yes, uh, a, a participatory design project, specifically a radical participatory design project, can be initiated by a community, can be initiated by a professional designer. Either is fine. The whether or not it's radical or not determ is determined by the participation and the leadership. So yes, I can. Like I said, I, the first time I did this was at Google. I can be in an organization and initiate a project, right? And say, hey, um, I'd like to work on some digital literacy. I want to gather some people, so I do that. And then th those community members help me gather other community members to make sure that we have what I call a qualitatively representative sample on the design and research team. And then we figure out what we want to do, right? That, that's how it, it started. Um, community members can do radical participatory design because they have a problem or they have an issue or there's something they want to work on. They want to re-envision a public space or whatever it is. And they get together and then they may call in. There's different, there's different, it's a spectra. So it's different um, amounts of participation with the professional designer. But sometimes they may just call in professional designers when they need them for a specific skill set. Okay, we got we have this design, but we don't know if it actually works. Let's bring in an architect. Let's bring in a structural engineer to make sure that this could be possible, et cetera. You know, sometimes they'll bring them in from the very beginning to be part of the team, et cetera, et cetera. It just, it just depends. Sometimes they have community members that embody those roles already. So their primary role might be community member, but their work is as a designer and they're bringing their design skills as a community member. Um, so it can be initiated from the community side or the, or the, or the, organizational designer side and i'm not sure uh, if i answered your question yeah. yeah i think so and the reason why i'm maybe so uh nitpicking on this topic is as it, it feels like the agenda 
uh, is super important or who sets the agenda. Because if you're mm. setting the agenda as somebody who's a part of an organization, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe whether in in a in a case where it's a foundation doing good for the world like there there's maybe but when you're part of a company having there's always mm -hmm. there's a business incentive so i'm 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 oh yeah it it feels like that there there will be some uh tensions there yes definitely definitely i mean the it, it's one of the ways that we can exploit or take advantage in order to start a process like this, right? So you have an organization and they say, look, I don't want to do this. I'm able to make money without doing radical participatory design. So why do this at all? So you as a designer who, are, who really cares about democratic processes and social justice, you want to do this, but your organization doesn't care about it. So there's different strategies that we do or we employ to begin to move towards radical participatory design. But one of them is called using a failed project, which is what I did the very first time I did it. So I had a project. It was the pet project of a vice president. And it it failed, I want to say, three times. And back then I was in I was in this organization that had this model of of beta products. You you don't you don't fully develop just get it to a point, put it out there and learn as it's put it out there, out there. And that's what that's what the VP wanted. So we wanted to put this pro project out there, this educational product and service out there for the world and just learn as we go. But it, there wasn't any, you know, take, uh, there wasn't any uptake. We wanted by a certain deadline, we wanted to have, I want to say 150,000 or maybe 15,000. I can't remember exactly uh, people certified through this, right? And by that deadline, we only had 1,500 registered. People didn't have an incentive to deliver this educational service, all the partners that we were working with. They didn't have an incentive to teach it, to, to work with people. And then the people who would sign up to learn didn't have an incentive to do it. <laughs> so people weren't doing it. So I said, well, hey, can I go out and do some of this work that I've been asking to do? But you said there wasn't a time. They're like, no, now there's even less time because it failed. But fix it. Put it out there again. So we do that. Hey, it failed again. Can I, do, you know, take some time, work with community members and kind of, no, there's even less time because now it's failed again, you know, third time. So the VP leaves the organization. I don't know if it's specifically because of this project, but we were working in a tough environment. I was in a part of, a, of the company focused on what they called emerging markets. So low to middle income countries building educational products and services. And we had really ambitious goals, but often in settings that didn't have as many resources as some of these other, other places around the world. So it was tough with big ambitious goals, but low resource settings. Um, oftentimes we didn't reach our goals, right? So he left the project lead on my project switched to another project. And at that point, we had new leadership come in and I said, can I can I go and do this thing that I've been asking to do to work with community members? They're like, fine, do whatever you want. We don't they didn't care. And then that's that gave me the green light. I had the money, I had the, uh, we had networks of people and I could reach out, build the community. And then we together decided, is this something we want to do? Right. Because I, I had an agenda. I wanted to work on this thing, but I'm flexible with my agenda to say, if the community doesn't want this, we, we're not going to do this. Or if the community wants to move in a different direction, then we move in a different direction, right? So I say, hey, there's this digital literacy thing. I, I think it might be important here. And we were working in North Central India. Are you all open? Got together. And then we, we talked about it and we uh, they decided, yes, we framed it and we did the work. This this definitely requires, um, this. I would say this isn't suitable for every challenge out there, obviously. Like, how would you describe the challenges that have the biggest chance of actually working and benefiting from, from this approach? Like, what are some of the ingredients? One of the things you already mentioned is you had, you had the freedom to potentially sc scrap the entire project if you found out that the community wasn't interested, right? That's, it sounds, that sounds like a key ingredient. Yeah. I mean, you know. It's hard for businesses to do it because they can always take advantage of people who who will use what they want or they can create the demand. Right. But 
it, it actually does have a business case in, in, in that if you want to create something that people want and will use, um, it actually helps to bring them into the process, right? Now, you may be operating as a company in a culture, in a country or in a culture where that doesn't matter. You can kind of create the demand. But in a lot of the places I was working, if you really wanted people to use it, in the example I gave, they were not using it. You needed to bring them in. And if you want to expand to more and more places around the world, it's really helpful to bring those people into the process, right? Uh, and really to create things that they they have been a part of. So um, ultimately, I think, well, let me take a step back. Your your question specifically, can you repeat your question? Because then I've, well, I've lost my I, train of thought. Well, everything is interesting what we're discussing so far, so that's totally fine. But um, I was looking for ingredients yeah. in in challenges uh like what may what makes a good challenge that fits this approach because i i really actually think you could do it with with most projects the question is really the the willingness of the organization right to allow it so um if if you told me hey i want to make um a calendar application for people in Australia. And the company said, hey, I'm willing to do radical disorder design. I think you could actually still do it and it could work, right? It's not necessarily that the, the challenge of what you're creating affects whether or not. It's really the organizational environment um, and the um, understanding of these different types of knowledges and how you treat that um, and the relationship between the community and the, and the professional designers. That allows it that allows it to happen but uh i'll give you i'll give you some examples of of challenges when i say challenges now i'm switching to difficulties you you experience when you do this right so so one is that um people are still people even if they're from the community and they're not the professional designers so they bring with them their experiences just like professional designers bring experiences and they bring with them their biases just like professional designers have biases. So you still have to deal with the bias of the community members on your team, number one. And number two, you still have to deal with possibly having a biased group of the community on your team. So I actually work really hard to number one, try to get a qualitatively representative sample of the community on the research and design team. And I may not be the best person to figure that out. So the first thing I do is just get people to be on the team and the community knows best the different categories and qualities of, of the community members and how we might best construct that. So um, I don't worry too much about that initially. I just get people on the team. And then once I have community members on the team, they help to kind of get the right people on the team um, in order to create a balanced uh, team. The second thing I'll say, because I know you, I'm, I'm sparking ideas and you want to respond. The second thing I want to say is that we do a lot of um, bias awareness um, uh, activities and methods. We do a lot of activities to reduce the impact of our bias. Um, and I haven't ever worked professionally on design teams that do that actively in every project. And I do that when I'm, whenever I'm running a project, I do that actively in all, all our projects. We're always bringing our what we call positionality to the forefront, making it visible and bringing our biases aware. Uh, and becoming aware of it and seeing how it could potentially impact and and change the direction and we're always bringing that um go ahead no oh, yeah uh <laughs> well I'll, I'll, let me let me check this observation with you like i feel that uh for to fully reap the fruits of this approach you need to be very early in the process like um even before maybe you have identified a challenge or a sol solution that's already 18 steps too far but you need to invite the community and ask them like we think that this is an opportunity do you also think that this is an opportunity and if it isn't like are there any other challenges like you need to be it's hard to describe but in a in a, in a different mindset set different stage when you start engaging in this way of working compared to compared yeah, I mean, maybe to how organizations are 
use to work right now? Yes. In fact, I would say if you don't bring them the community in at the earliest possible moment, you're 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 not doing this approach, mm -hmm. right? That's the whole idea. It's radical. It's all the way. So they are there from the beginning. Um, so if they're not there from the beginning, it's not. I wouldn't call it radical participatory design. In, yeah, and one uh, one uh, visualization that I have in my mind right now is ideally, like your board of directors would be the community, and and you as a organization, which is a group of people, processes, systems, are facilitating this community. Like it 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 flips the model completely around. Yeah, in fact, I think. They're, they're examples um, of what we call community institutional review boards, IRBs, but it's community members that then can approve or reject the research that an organization is doing that's trying to do it in a participatory way, right? Or the designs that an that a organization is trying to do in a participatory way. The, uh, so some people try to do it through that way, like, okay, well, we don't have the availability, we don't have time-wise, but we could set up a board that then reviews the process of what this organization is doing. I think that's a level removed. Um, I like having the community review boards, but only if I also have communities um, in the day-to-day decision-making as well. Mm -hmm. uh, let's let's uh, sort of try to head towards a, a wrap-up of, uh, of our conversation. Uh, a few more questions. One of them is, um, I'm curious how your thinking about this has evolved over the recent years. The biggest evolution is trying to distill through induction after doing this over and over. What what are the what are the qualities? What are the guidelines? Um, it's not really a methodology. It's more of an approach. You can use whatever methodology. And so that's what I've done. I've I've written it down. I've done a few talks at a few conferences. And so I'm I'm hopefully going to get some academic papers published on it. And you know. It's also been in trying to respond to people who say, I like it, but I struggle with it, right? So one of the answers, for instance, that I give to people who say, well, look, I'm a professional designer. This doesn't leave me any place, right? And I gave you the example of the doctor, but one of the examples I, I give to when, when people say, well, what place do I have as a professional designer? I talk about cooking, right? Cooking is a great example in which really everyone or many people do it, not, not necessarily everyone. Many people do it, and it's, it's an important thing for people to do, right? However, there is still a role for professional chefs today. They can run a restaurant. So sometimes people cook a lot but at home, but they don't want to cook all the time. So they might go to a restaurant, and a chef can provide a particular kind of experience. Number two, they might cater. So I have an event, and I might reach out to a chef or a catering company that can design a food experience for the event. Number three, professional chefs create cookbooks with recipes that people can try and use. However, this doesn't mean that there aren't recipes and oral cookbooks that different communities and cultures have used and, and do use for centuries, right? Um, maybe they don't publish it in written format and make money in selling it, um, but it's there, right? And if they were to publish it, or if someone were to understand and learn those methods, some of these people who do the publishing in written form of cookbooks, or you could say Western culinary chefs, could learn from some of these methods, right? So there's still a place for actual chefs, right? Um, it, they still have a role in society, even though everyone should learn how to cook, or, or it's important to learn how to cook to, 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 uh, for, their, for their life. <laughs> for, 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 for their health. Yeah. So, um, you know, you want, maybe I want to learn how to cook in more healthy ways. So I look at someone who's published something related to that. So there's different things we can learn from each other. And we need more conversation between these types of cookbooks <laughs> to continue the analogy. Yeah. Uh, we'll definitely continue that analogy, but, uh, on, on a later uh, conversation, uh, Victor, so you mentioned, um, that people maybe struggle with this and I can, I hope that there is somebody listening uh, right now and thinks, mm, I wish there was more that I could read or see or do or practice. What would you say are some of a few good resources for somebody to get familiar with this and maybe get started? 
Yeah, it's a tough question because I it it's uh, I don't know that I have. Well, I, I'll what I'll do is I'll I'll send you uh, some links to just different examples or maybe some case studies where people can look at, at that. I'm working on a writing where you can kind of see my thoughts in written form based on what I've seen as a, as commonalities across these projects. So maybe elements that all of them have. Um, but in essence, this is just, you know, this is just a way of, of, of doing any methodology. And this is just radical it's to the root. It's all the way. So I am working specifically on trying to spread this by getting more organizations to do it. So my goal really is that you would have an organization and they would have a participatory design unit. Maybe they're not ready to do it for everything, but they'll have a unit. Um, specifically, I'm working, um, I've been, I've already had one conversation with the DC local government because I think government civic design is a perfect place to begin that process. Um, as a civic designer, um, I think my role is different than as a UX designer in an organization. In an organization, I'm trying to find the intersection between business um, needs and user needs. But if I live in a country that aspires to democratic ideals and I'm a civic designer, there should not be a difference between the needs of the people and the needs of the government by the people the needs of the people and the needs of the government of the people, the needs of the people and the needs of the government for the people. It should be one. And so my job is to realign those because our bureaucracy has taken those further apart. And so I've been talking and trying to get groups to start participatory design units inside of government programs where they have innovation studios. The difficulty, of course, is that at any point, a radical participatory design process can immediately flip to what I call a colonial participatory design process. You know, you can come in, the community's created this nice prototype and I can come in as the executive and say, no, we're not gonna do that. Oh, so you didn't actually give up power. You just pretended to, right? And that's why I always talk about, um, there are a lot of resources I can share on, on power, if you just wanna read about power. But the main thing that I say with radical participatory design is we don't empower, right? Because when you empower, if that's even possible, you're actually reinforcing the hierarchy that you're trying to subvert. You're saying you have the power, I have the power, we as professional designers have the power to choose who participates, when they participate, how they participate, if they participate. What we try to do in radical history design, instead of empowering other people, we just give up power. The community will assume power. They, 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 they can empower themselves, they'll assume power, but we have to give up power uh, to create space. So I'll, I'll share some I'll share some things. I think one great book is the book that I'm reading that I was telling you about designs for the pluriverse, which goes into um, autonomous design uh, of commute by, by communities. It talks about transition design. Um, I think those are really great starting points to begin to see what it looks like across the world in communities that are trying to um, establish themselves. I am also a person that says radical participatory design doesn't have to involve a professional designer. Some people say no. Participatory design only means if there's both professional designers and community members. And I say, no, as long as it's community members, it's, it's, it's participatory for me, uh, as long as it involves the people that are, that are going to use it. So, Victor, if, um, if people want to continue this conversation, um, maybe with you, uh, is there a way they can reach out? Yeah, yeah. If you send me a note on LinkedIn, don't just connect with me. If you connect with me and you don't write anything, I don't. Don't accept it. So just say and send a note like, hey, <clears throat> excuse me. I heard you speaking on the service design show. I wanted to connect to talk more. You can also send me an email. I'm happy for you to email me. Victor dot my my surname, U D O E W A at NASA.gov. I'm happy to talk there as well. All right. I hope many people do respond. Um I know we started with uh with a question. Um one of the first questions was what do you hope people will remember? Now let me um uh, rephrase this question a, a bit differently. If you had to summarize our, I don't know, maybe it's even 60 minutes, <laughs> less 60 minutes. Um, how would you summarize this conversation? It's time to begin to give up power and, and allow communities. I shouldn't even say allow communities, but to give up power and communities will then will assume the power. Um, it's time to continue and deepen the decolonial turn that is occurring in the design field 
Um, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of what knowledge is, how it's produced, uh, as well as um, ways of being in the world. And it's time to explore uh, different ways of designing that result from a relational ways of being and relational ways of knowing. So if you are a designer, I really encourage you to practice giving up more power and especially to begin to practice design in communities in which you're already a member. I try to do that as much as possible. So one of the reasons I work at NASA is because now as an employee at NASA, when I work on the employee experience, I'm not an outsider. I'm an employee myself working on that employee experience. Of course, I'm not a customer so I, for the programs that I work in, so I have to bring in customers for that part. But I'm, I'm working on a racial uh, justice project at a parent-teacher association or parent-teacher organization. As a parent of a child at the school, we're working to design a racially just PTA. I have another project where I'm working on doing a futures design for two schools uh, to create a racially just future. And we're building a roadmap of design changes to our school community, but I'm a member of the school community. So it, it makes sense. So I invite you to begin to do that. Try practicing design more in communities in which you're already a member. I, I, yeah, I love that. And uh, like that's, that's maybe the, the hack that if you don't see the opportunity yet to do it in your professional environment right now, nobody, nobody is stopping you from doing this in the communities where you're already part of, which aren't paying your salary. And maybe that's that's a great way to, to get started. Victor, I just want to thank you for doing this important work, for sort of pioneering this. Um, I don't know, getting people uh, excited about these ideas, showing, I think, what's possible, creating awareness, like uh, turning the unknown unknown into the known unknown. That That's really important work. So uh, once again, thanks. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I'll, I'll leave you with one final thought. I've noticed, again, this is a pattern. When I've done a project of participatory design and it's truly been radically participatory, there's this strange transformation that happens where people are not the same at the end of the process. And I would say a majority of the research and design team members, a majority, experience a shift in power. Um, so that first project that I mentioned, I mean, one person in the community became a project manager, another a product manager, another a designer, another an engineer, another received a promotion because of the work they were doing. Another, another had a, a flower business and that business improved. Um, I brought in three people from the sales and marketing organization just to help diversify the team from my, from my organization. I didn't bring any designers or engineers and they all gave up their jobs within a year on to other things. I gave up my job within a year and moved on to other things. So, it, and it's happening again. I'm, I'm at NASA and someone on, on this participatory design team, I didn't initiate this, I didn't make the offer, was offered by executives higher up, was offered a permanent position to join my team based on the skills that she had been gaining. So this is kind of a natural thing. And the beauty of it is if, if it's truly embracing multiple visions of the good life or what a good future is that the community members have the right to reject it. Oh, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't view becoming some designer as the best thing in the world. And that happens as well. Um, I've seen people say, no, I'm fine because they have a, a different vision of what, of what's good for them. And that's okay because part of what happens when you do radical participatory design is you move into what we call pluriversal design or, or pluriversal futures. Uh, where you have a pluralistic vision of of what the future is. So I leave you with that and hopefully that inspires some of you. Yes, thank you for that inspiration and sort of a disclaimer, uh, as in know what you're <laughs> getting yourself into. Uh, change, change is around the corner when this happens. Um, Victor, awesome that you came on uh, the show. Happy that we were able to make this happen. I'm looking forward to uh, chatting with more people who are practicing uh, this and experimenting uh, with it. So, but first of all, yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. What's your take on radical participatory design? Are you interested in applying this in your own practice? Make sure to leave a comment down below and let's continue the conversation over there. 
If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to also click that subscribe button so that you'll be notified when a new conversation comes out. Thanks so much for watching to the Service Design Show and I look forward to see you in the next video.